Or there are other people. Yeah, so yeah, so Okay, well it looks like it's time to get started. So today it's my pleasure to introduce Ted Peterson, who is a professor in the computer science department at the University of Minnesota, believe, where the weather we've been having this week is perfectly normal. So, yes. <laughs> yeah, right at home. Uh, so, um, Ted's research is broadly speaking in natural language processing. Uh, he's best known for doing work in uh, the area of, of called lexical semantics. So, understanding similarities and relationships between words and phrases, which is an important part at the core of NLP. He has also done uh, some NIH-funded work on medical ontologies with applications to health informatics. And he has an NSF Career Award. Uh, so, I think I'll leave it at that, and let's welcome Dr. Peterson. Thank you. And, um Yes, so the, the, the talk, the title of the talk uh, kind of reveals, I'm going to focus on talking about semantic similarity and relatedness today, um, and how it ties into some larger problems in natural language processing. Um, I thought I'd say a little bit about myself before we get too far into this, just to kind of reveal backgrounds, biases, and so forth. I am a computer scientist. I've been in computer science departments ever since I was an undergraduate, and so that is the world in which I have, have been. Um, I'm in a computer science department now where we have a master's program, pretty active master's uh, program, do not have a PhD program, although I've supervised a PhD student in the Twin Cities. Uh, fairly rare occurrence, but, but possible at least. Um, and uh, in thinking about today's talk, I realized there are kind of a few different things that I could have focused on, and I decided to talk about lexical semantics, because that has been kind of my core area since the very beginning. Uh, my first paper ever, I went back as a 1990s, Five spring symposium about ambiguity and polysem poly polysemy, uh, and uh, was actually about ontology enhancement, which I will be talking about today, and is in fact a pro something I'm working on like right now. So I have remained remarkably impervious to change, apparently. Um, I also have been doing a fair bit of work with medical and health informatics, and I kind of made a conscious decision to focus one way as opposed to the other, just to kind of keep the, the length of the talk in line. Um, a lot of the work with lexical semantics, uh, that's primarily been done in Duluth with my, my students there, and it's in the medical and health domain where I have uh, established various collaborations over the years, that um, some of which are, are continuing. Um, and so that's kind of the, 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 some of the big picture issues. Um, just a few sort of philosophical statements, I guess, that I think are important. Uh, uh, one is I've been fairly committed to the idea of doing what we do as openly and as transparently as we can. Uh, this, this, I think, helps promote a certain reproducibility in our, in our work, which I think is important. Uh, also, I think making resources available, uh, holding open competitions or shared tasks, uh, again, I think encourages participation in a community. And so, in general, uh, some of the motivations here are to make it easier for folks to get started in these areas. Um, the software mentioned is all kind of woven throughout what we're going to talk about today, so it's all kind of out there, um, ready for whatever you care to do with it. Um, enough about me. Uh, it, as we go through this talk today, as I say, a lot of the lexical semantics work has been done with my students in Duluth. Uh, this is them, uh, primarily master's students, although you see a couple of postdocs who are in the Twin Cities, uh, all of them very much involved in the work that I'm talking about today. Um, I will probably not do a good enough job assigning credit, so I, I, I wanted to at least mention them at the outset so that it didn't go unnoticed. Um, and so, um, about this talk uh, today, uh, I want to talk first just in general, what do we mean by similarity and relatedness? Uh, what, what is that? Um, and then, how do we measure that? How can we, how can we measure what this is? Um, and then what can we do with it? And what would we like to do with it? So kind of four parts uh, to the talk today. Um, things that will come up time and time again when we talk about measuring 
similarity and relatedness, we're, we're usually dealing with different, various different information sources, including ontologies and corpora, large samples of text. Uh, these will appear and reappear throughout the talk today, uh, so, so, that, so they're disclosing that to you. Uh, the particular kinds of problems that we'll work our way to are, are listed here, um, including the idea of discovering hypernyms or is it relationships, like a cat is a feline, uh, is an animal, that sort of thing. Um, and then also how do we take and add new content to existing ontologies, uh, ontology enhancement, uh, kind of the classic problem of assigning meaning to words and sentences. Uh, word sense disambiguation, these are things that we do now with these ideas. And the future, um, I just really want to like build dictionaries like automatically. That's, it's like Noah Webster in a computer. Um, and so that's where this is all heading. Um, so what about similarity and relatedness? Uh, just to kind of establish warm feelings between us, uh, I, I would like to uh, offer, uh, these are similar, right? We're seeing two cats, two kittens, they share many characteristics, very similar. Um, the cat, uh, the, the mountain, or the lion, I guess, and the, and, the, and the cat, again, similar, right? They have similar sorts of ears and facial features even, four legs, tails. We see some similarity there still. Um, we can even talk about similarity across species, I guess. Uh, uh, a puppy and a kitten, similar. Again, in some of the fundamental characteristics, four legs, two eyes, ears, uh, and so on. These are similar ideas. Um, we can even talk about being similar, for example, the, the little cat and an elephant. Similar, although to a lesser extent. Uh, elephant, bigger, but it still has four legs, two eyes, kind of big floppy ears. And so the idea here is just to sort of say that there, things can be similar to, to varying degrees. And so when we talk about measuring similarity, it's, it's, it's quantifying the, this kind of observation that we're making. How do we quantify this to, 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 to give numbers to these kinds of relationships that we can observe? Um, now, next example, similar, uh, cats or kittens, balls of yarn, they go together. Um, but are they similar? And in fact, we wouldn't say they're similar because while kittens or cats love balls of yarn, they don't really share any characteristics. They don't, a ball of yarn doesn't have four legs, doesn't have two eyes, and so forth. And so this is what we call relatedness. Um, and similarity is often used in kind of a colloquial way where it kind of bleeds into relatedness and stuff, but we want to be fairly sharp about that uh, distinction here. And so, um, uh, so we would say the kitten and the ball of yarn are indeed related, but not really similar. Um, and so to be similar then, uh, we're, we're kind of formalizing our definition here a little bit. Uh, to be similar is to share characteristics. Uh, panthers, tabby cats have sharp claws. Uh, and when we talk about measuring similarity, we're actually talking about something pretty specific. We're talking about accessing or using information that we can find in an ISA hierarchy uh, to establish these kinds of quantified measures. Um, you've seen the term hypernyms already. That's a kind of more formal way of saying an ISA relationship. Uh, I kind of float back and forth between using both of those. So, um, you know, that's, they're, they're, they're essentially synonymous. Um, and so if we think about similarity in terms of, of uh, is a hierarchy, then we can even formalize things a little bit more and say, and, and say that for two things to be similar, to be more similar, suggests that they're going to have a not so distant common ancestor in this hierarchy. And, and if you start to picture in your mind's eye a hierarchy of, of animals and so forth, you can kind of see that, well, kittens and elephants indeed are joined, maybe kind of high up in the is a hierarchy. Uh, where cats and lions may be a little lower uh, being feline. And so that, again, starts to give us a way of quantifying this relationship. Um, relatedness, uh, for as precise as we are about relatedness, uh, or as, for as precise as we are about similarity, relatedness is a much blurrier sort of uh, idea. Um, there are lots of ways to be related. Uh, you can, in fact, uh, kind of intuitively imagine that 
Uh, there are about as many ways to be related as there are verbs. Uh, and so, you know, you could have a play with relationship between kittens and yarn, uh, or you could have a prey upon relationship between cats and mice. Uh, cats prey upon mice. It goes from right there. Um, and so, um, so when we talk about relatedness, that's what we mean. It's a much different, more general kind of idea. Um, and so now, these are not mutually exclusive relationships. Things can be both similar and related. Um, and uh, uh, it's possible, for example, a cat and a mouse, mouse are both mammals. Uh, so they're similar in that sense. We also have this prey upon relationship. A cat is a, a predator of a mouse. And I'm going to show you a, a rather frightening image of a cat clutching a mouse. I, I caution you, uh, be brave. Uh, and uh, ah, <laughs> what happened? Okay, wait a minute. So the cat's clutching a mouse. Okay, this didn't quite work out. What happened to my slides? Um, and so, okay, let's back off of this. It's that's too hard of an example. Let's let's we'll go for cat and jaguar. Right, you might, maybe you can anticipate me here. Um, cat and jaguar are both felines. Reasonably specific common ancestor. Pretty safe example, right? Oh, okay, so there's a cat and a jaguar and another kind of jaguar. And, and so where are we going with this? What's, what's, what's the message? Oh, wait, no, no, it's getting worse. There's another cat, a big yellow cat. And wait, am I just playing with examples here? Uh, I mean, cat is an abbreviation of caterpillar. And, you know, what, what's, what's the message here? What's the point? Um, and so, OK, we'll do caterpillar and jaguar. And it doesn't get any better here. And it gets worse if you allow for the existence of Jacksonville Jaguars and human caterpillars. There are lots and lots of different kinds of caterpillars and jaguars. And so where is this going? Well, I'm conceding that initially, when I was talking about similarity and relatedness, I, I glossed over this issue of ambiguity. Um, and there were a few reasons for that. Uh, one is to get started. and you know, kind of a relatively straightforward way. But the other is to, to perhaps have you pause and think about, when I showed you those examples, did you really think about the multiple possible senses? And if you did, then I, I congratulate you as a lexicographer in the making or a lexicographer already. Uh, but I think a lot of the times we don't really stop and think about these kinds of multiple interpretations of meaning, particularly when we have multiple related concepts or senses or words in the same context or occurring together in pairs. There's something that happens there that lets us focus in on what the, the senses or the, the meanings of these that are most related to each other or most similar to each other. And so I kind of did a little experiment on you there without your permission that you can draw your own conclusions from. Um, but. Um, the other point to make about that is to, to, to perhaps suggest that similarity and relatedness are really very fundamental concepts, fundamental ideas about that, that influence how we're able to understand and assign meanings. And so if we, if we know what a word means, uh, we, we can often, uh, we often know what it's similar or related to. Um, and if we, if we know what a word is similar to, we can often figure out its meaning. So there's an example. Popular in Minnesota is Lefsa. Um, it's a, and if I if you don't know what Lefsa is, I could tell you it's like a tortilla. And so you have a picture in your mind. They're okay, tortilla, kind of a flat thing, except it's made with potatoes. That's what Lefsa is. And so the point here is just to suggest that we can leverage similarity and relatedness in ways that help us uh, to, to better grasp and understand meaning and that uh, uh, this is a real kind of a fundamental sort of relationship that uh, will be useful to us as we, as we go along here. Um, so first order of business, we've, we've talked a little bit now about what similarity and relatedness are. Next on the agenda is how can we measure that? Um, we have a few different possibilities. This is where we're going to need to take advantage of a lot of different kinds of information resources. Uh, there are a lot of structured resources that we can use, ontologies, taxonomies, hierarchies, dictionaries, uh, so forth, uh, where concepts and relations between them have been specified and, and made fairly apparent, made fairly formal. 
Um, and there are lots of these available, lots of these kinds of resources available, so it seems both pragmatic and reasonable to use them. Uh, we also have abundant amounts of written text. And so there, concepts, underlying meanings are perhaps less apparent, but they're there. And so the question is, can, how can we fish out some of this kind of information from, from both of these kinds of um, information? And so, um, when I say structured resources, there, there are a few, of, a few to mention here. Um, WordNet and UMLS have been kind of my, some of my go-to uh, resources. Uh, Wiktionary has become kind of interesting to me of late. Uh, I'm a great fan of OED, Oxford English Dictionary. I love it, but they, they're not real open to using it for anything but exactly what they intended to be used for. But uh, wonderful, wonderful resource and so on. So, so these are the kinds of things I'm thinking of when I'm thinking of structured resources. So you see there's some variety there. Um, and so the first idea for how do we measure, that's the question we're trying to answer here. How can we measure these kinds of uh, similarity relations? Well, one is just, okay, let's exploit the ISA hierarchies that are out there in these structured resources. And there's, in fact, a long tradition of that. This, this actually goes back uh, to the previous century, fairly, fairly far back in the previous century, and uh, is still, in certain circumstances, a pretty worthwhile uh, avenue to, uh, to pursue. And so there are a few different ideas here uh, that I want to run through very quickly just to give you a sense of various ways we can, we can do these kinds of measurements. Um, and so let's think about um, and is a hierarchy. Now, this is, a, this is not a, a warm, uh, uh, kitten-oriented uh, hierarchy. This is a kind of modified hierarchy of infections. Uh, and so we have athlete's foot, of which there are several varieties, apparently, the, the well-named moccasin's moccasin athlete's foot, which actually is well-named. There's a picture coming up of that. Um, <laughs> um, not gonna, not gonna do that to you. But what you see, you see here a series of is a relations, right? This is a tree. We're, we're making some simplifying assumptions here, right? They're just one parent per concept. Um, this is a fairly orderly view of the world, and, and that's good for our purposes. Um, and and when we think about measuring similarity using this kind of hierarchical information, usually the key is is to recognize that most specific common ancestor and then do something with that. So in this case, I'm looking at strep throat and tetanus, and uh, their, their most specific shared ancestor is bacterial infection. So this is kind of basic information we can get from this. Um, now, when we think about this kind of a hierarchy, or with, when we look at this kind of a diagram, it may be very natural to think in terms of finding uh, paths in a graph, um, and that you know the distances between the nodes is going gonna, is gonna to kind of tell us something about how similar these are. And to an extent that's true, but these hierarchies are not really drawn to scale. And so the, um, the links between concepts at the higher levels of the, of the is a hierarchy, closer to the root, tend to travel much more semantic distance than the, than the deeper, lower positioned uh, hierarchy uh, concepts do in our hierarchy. And so shortest path tends to create some kind of noisy, anomalous kinds of results uh, that need some correcting. Um, for example, uh, we can look at our friend uh, strep throat and tetanus, and if we think about finding path length just in terms of counting the number of nodes between these two concepts, uh, including the concepts themselves, we see there's a path of four nodes from strep throat to streptococcal infection to bacterial infection to tetanus. That's four, one divided by four. So that's a, a path-based measure, shortest path. Um, the anomaly uh, we can start to see if we look at a pair of concepts that are perhaps not as deep, more general, slightly more general, and we see the same kind of path distance for uh, nodes between yeast infection and bacterial infection. And it scores the same as this more specific example, though, and that may start to feel a little, a, a little off. Uh, in that um, the more specific concepts probably do share more characteristics and are probably more similar as a result. Um, and so a very simple uh, correction is just to look at the depth of the concepts that you're essentially finding the distance between. And notice here all we're doing is we're, we're noting the depth, the, the, the depth in the tree of the concepts of that most 
specific shared ancestor bacterial infection. That is a depth of two down from the root. And then we look at the depth of strep throat and, and tetanus. And you can see we just take two times the depth of that shared ancestor and divide that by the sum of the depth of the lower, uh, more specific concepts. And we get a different value here. Um, and then when you do that same thing with bacterial and yeast infection, we get a lower score because those are higher up and less uh, specific. And so we start to see maybe a more reasonable sorting of, uh, of values as a result. Um, now this is quite simple, but if you have a, if you have a relatively clean hierarchy, uh, this, this, this kind of approach can actually do quite well. Um, and so, um, however, there are, there's information out there that we're not using, if we're, if we're using our ISA hierarchy, uh, we can also think about maybe adding information from corpora uh, to our ontology in order to further refine our judgments. Um, this notion of structural depth gives us a sense of specificity uh, of the concepts by how deep they are, but it doesn't let necessarily tell us too much about the frequency. Um, and so sometimes low frequency concepts, things that we don't see that often, can, they, they may in fact be more low frequent, they may be more less frequent uh, perhaps because they're a little more specific and so they don't come up that often in, uh, in, our, in, our, in our writing, in our discourse. And so information content is an idea that tries to capture this idea really just by using probabilities of, of these concepts in, in corpora and then augmenting the ontology with those. Um, this is a kind of refinement to that depth-based approach where we're still using essentially those same nodes and the same kind of calculation actually, all we're doing is replacing the depth values with information content values, which give us a little bit more granularity here. And so the information content values, as I say, are, are, are calculated from probabilities in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the cor in a corpus, any corpus, and um, a parent node has its own information content and it also inherits the information content of its children. And so more general concepts, those higher in the hierarchy tend to have lower information content values. Um, and so we're able here to um, refine that notion of depth, uh, giving us information about more specific concepts. Um, and so again, if we do our, uh, our strep throat tetanus example, we can see there's kind of a different number here and we get a, another different number with bacterial infection and yeast infection, again, kind of reflecting uh, and showing that we're managing that specificity somehow differently. Um, so the answer seems clear. Uh, I'm convinced. Give me a taxonomy of the world and we're done. We can, we can break early here and, uh, uh, and uh, sadly not to be. Uh, we do not get a tax taxonomy of the world uh, because there are many ways that we can see the world. Uh, different languages, different domains, uh, different kinds of users. And indeed, there's much more to organizing information and concepts than recording is a relations. We have lots and lots of kind of information that we can uh, rely upon. For example, definitions, uh, kind of a very valuable uh, resource. Uh, other kinds of relations. Uh, you know, this, this general class of relatedness is made up of lots of different relations, like has part, causes, treats, etc., etc. Um, and so there's a lot more to the world than is a hierarchy. And so we need to think about how can we use that to reach some kind of judgment or decision about how related uh, similar things are. And so, again, how can we measure given that, okay, let's accept the premise that we need more than is a hierarchy. Um, how can we measure? Well, let's, let's talk about these definitions. Um, definitions are with us in many different kinds of resources. Um, they're very interesting from the point of view of, of, of dealing with the relatedness and similarity because if you think about a definition, typically two senses that are similar or related will have definitions that are also similar or related. They often will use some of the same terms. And in fact, if you uh, sort of reason uh, towards complete similarity or synonymy, synonyms, of course, have exactly the same definition. And so there's, there's something we can tell about the world from definitions. Um, another nice quality of definitions is that they don't necessarily need to be connected to a hierarchy or structure to utilize them. It can be advantageous if they are, but they don't have to be. 
Um, and so there are some pluses. The difficulty with definitions, of course, not of course, but a difficulty with definitions often is that they are short, they are inconsistent, uh, and they can be a little bit messy to, to work with. So um, let's think again about um, uh, different kinds of ontologies. Imagine here that I have two distinct ontologies. I have an instruction in ontology of fungal infections and hair disorders. And so the photos to follow here. Um, and uh, we're interested in both of these domains for whatever reason. And, oh, did I do something? Yeah, bad idea. I should know better than I should know better than cables. I would just go on and I would say, imagine a hierarchy of hair disorders. I'll let you think about that. Um, and, um, and so dealing with multiple ontologies is actually a pretty common problem. There are lots of different ontologies out there. And sometimes they have distinct kinds of information. Uh, or they have information that, we, that may seem distinct, but that we want to use for a particular problem. And so uh, one solution uh, might be to just say, okay, you know what? I've got two separate ontologies. I'm going to make them into one. I'm going to, I'm going to just put a top level and join them together, and then I'm going to use those those is a measures that, that I'm so excited by. And I, that's a possibility, but the problem is there. When you introduce that top level, you're often introducing this massive journey in semantic space, where if you are measuring between concepts that were in the formerly separate uh, ontologies, these measures don't necessarily have a whole lot of meaning or significance because it's such a, a radical jump up to that top level. Um, and so this might be an example of, of where we can think about using definitions. Um, and so I'm showing a few uh, definitions here. I'm not sure how clear those are. I'll just read one as an example. So we have oral thrush. As a definition here, a yeast infection that causes white patches in your mouth, it can occur when the immune system is weakened or as a side effect of chemotherapy. Um, and so if we have definitions for concepts in or not in an ontology, we can potentially use those to recognize some kinds of relatedness or even similarity between those concepts. And let's, let's just uh, see. One simple idea uh, is to look at just Find overlaps, like are they using the same words? And so, you know, again, synonyms, same definition, definitions that are using some of the same words, there's probably some kind of relatedness there, and we can measure that by the degree of the overlaps. Uh, now again, I'm not sure how, how clear this is, but you can see that we have a couple of alopecia and folliculitis are both hair disorders, um, and so the, those, those match. Uh, and uh, we also have side effects of chemotherapy, or oral thrush and alopecia. Um, now, if we look at the ontology, uh, we can actually see that what we're getting from the definition there in terms of a hair disorder is actually also present in the structure of the ontology. And so this um, makes us think a few things. Uh, one is that definitions are often written such that a, a superclass or a parent is mentioned first, like a cat is a feline that has thick fur or what have you. Uh, same thing with alopecia and folliculitis, and so kind of implicitly we're getting some is a hierarchy information there, and that can be really useful if we want to get into the business of building our own uh, hierarchies. Um, we can also see here a connection between two uh, concepts that are not in the same ontology, and that are that, that both are though uh, uh, side effects of chemotherapy. Not something that we would see if we were looking at the is a uh, structure only. 
Um, and so this is mostly, uh, I think, just kind of r repeating that. Um, the side effect of chemotherapy there is kind of the interesting case in terms of looking at definitions because that's not something we'd see from the ISA structure. Um, the, what we see about the hair disorders, indeed, that reflects the ISA hierarchies, but it's also kind of a hint about if you want to build ISA hierarchies from text. Well, you know, certain kinds of text or certain kinds of information you can do that. So a little bit, a little bit of foreshadowing. There. Um, so this has been, these, these ideas have been around for, again, a good while. Um, the idea of finding overlaps in definitions, often referred to as LESC-type measures um, or LESC measures. And uh, uh, this was something that we extended uh, in a relatively straightforward way, but we exploited the, the structure of an ontology, uh, WordNet in this case, which is a general English resource of a, you know, a couple hundred thousand uh, words and uh, you know, pretty useful, um, where we take the definition of a concept and then we find other concepts that are related to it according to that resource and we add those definitions to the definition of the concept. And so we build a bigger, um, more extensive definition where we hopefully can find more sorts of overlaps. Uh, and so that's kind of a very simple idea behind uh, those extended glass overlaps. Um, the difficulty, though, uh, I regret to say, is this inconsistency of definitions. Uh, variations in the wording cause havoc. I have a confession to make. I've not only done experiments on you today, I've effectively lied to you. Um, and I, I rigged the example of alopecia and thrush to make the definition overlaps work out. So um, the original wording actually was with alopecia instead of side effect of chemotherapy, it's a result of cancer treatment. No matches, nothing matching there. And so this great example is, is, is sadly cooked. So make of that what you will. So there's still a question there. So, so I think a lot of the times there are those matches there. So it's not that we always need to read the examples. But the fact is that th this criteria of finding overlaps and matches is, is really pretty stringent. And there are lots of ways to say very comparable things. And so the question here becomes again, well, OK, result and side effect and cancer treatment and chemotherapy sure seem to be pretty similar or related. And so how can we figure that out? How can we avoid this, this sort of you know, cooking of examples and so forth? Um, how can we measure that? How can we do something about that? Um, and so this is where um, following the theme of we remember we expanded our ontologies with definitions. We can also expand our definitions maybe with some information from corpora. Um, and so um, one idea, uh, gloss vector measure, we call it, uh, is to rely on co-occurrences of words. And these are just words that occur within some proximity of each other. And this gives us a way of uh, accomplishing a kind of fuzzier matching. And we'll talk more about co-occurrences as we, as we go on here. But the, the basic idea is that um, let's imagine that cancer treatment and chemotherapy just aren't used together in text. I mean, it's probably not true. But let's imagine that, that they don't occur in close proximity to each other. And yet we know, we can see that, you know, there's a, there's a kind of is a relationship uh, there almost chemotherapy as a cancer treatment. Um, so how can we recognize that when they're not occurring together? Um, the idea is to look at what we, uh, what we and others call second order co-occurrences or a kind of a friend of a friend relation where you look at the words that occur with your terms of interest. So if we're interested in cancer treatment, we might find words that occur nearby in, in a corpus uh, that, include, that includes that, that term. Words maybe like result, prognosis, survival, and so forth. Chemotherapy, maybe we have things like side effects, survival, radiation uh, mentioned. Those common words between them join them. Uh, chemotherapy and cancer treatment, in this case, are joined to second order co-occurrences via their shared use of survival. And that gives us a little bit of information to go on. Um, and so the idea with this gloss vector measure is to basically take those words in the definitions and replace them with vectors of co-occurrences that we've observed in corpora. Um, and then you can just manipulate those vectors, maybe add them together to average them. And you end up with a single vector representing that definition that is effectively representing all these different co-occurring words 
that occur with the words in the definition. And we can then start measuring relatedness of words defined this way, doing simple vector space operations like cosine and so forth. Um, once you accept the premise that you can replace words and definitions with vectors, you can go crazy and do all kinds of stuff. And so recently, instead of we, we adapted the glass vector measure yet again, um, and so we replaced the words and definitions with vectors of similarity measures of their co-occurring words. So, uh, so for example, with, uh, with chemothera th chemotherapy, we would have a vector that would include the, the uh, similarity between, let's say, chemotherapy and uh, survival and things like that. So we, we create another kind of representation that allows us to measure relatedness via these kind of vector operations. And so, um, so we have been so far relying on lots and lots of information that we're getting from different kinds of ontologies or resources. And so what if we don't have one? What if there isn't one? Well, <laughs> good. You, you shouldn't always assume that you can get a text and get an ontology for everything that you want. Um, you're not always going to have that. So um, how can we measure, let's say, relatedness if we don't have any kind of resource? We don't have an is a hierarchy. We don't have definitions. We don't have anything. What do we do? We go back to corpora. And corpora has been of great interest and significance in terms of studying <coughs> meaning since long ago. Um, Wittgenstein very famously uh, talked about the meaning of a word is simply how it's used in language. It's a kind of a, a wasted effort of philosophical energy to try and do anything more than that. Um, I commonly called meaning is use. I just really like, I like these two guys staring at each other, so I had to do that. Um, Zelig Harris, uh, also, uh, he's often credited with what we call the distributional hypothesis, has kind of a, a longer discussion here, where um, basically arguing that when we're choosing to use words, we're actually following some pretty significant patterns of words that tend to be used together, and so we can detect that. Um, and then soon thereafter, uh, we get J.R. Firth, uh, who comes up with the kind of pithy, tweetable, you shall know a word by the company it keeps. Um, this, uh, uh, this actually sums it up quite nicely. Uh, this is a very commonly used quote, uh, you know, so much so it's almost a cliche in some ways, but it turns out to really be a good way to think about the impact of co-occurrence. Um, and so if we consider a really simple example, just our cat chases mice, my garage holds boxes, my dog chews bones, and we ask ourselves, which of these are more similar, related to each other? My guess is that you know the cat and the dog ones are probably in your mind. It's okay; those are kind of more like each other. And the question might be why. Um, and so, well, if we accept this notion of a distributional hypothesis, the uh, cat and dog are to some extent keeping similar company. If you think about the words that occur with cat and dogs, especially as used as household, not used, but as as members of your family. Um, words like pet and fur and vet come up with both of them, whereas garage, we have other kinds of terms. And so perhaps it's that kind of co-occurrence information that lets us draw these kinds of conclusions quickly, or perhaps is what we can have a more automated way of managing. And so how can we measure that kind of relatedness? Um, well, we can represent words with co-occurrences, and this gets us into a whole big space of methods that have been uh, raging on for generations now. Um, and uh, all of these ideas fundamentally are trying somehow to leverage this idea of co-occurrence. What can we draw from co-occurrence? How can we do that? Uh, what, does it, uh, what does it provide us? Um, and so as we've said, uh, real simply, real generally, the idea of co-occurrence is just what words tend to occur together. Um, within some number of positions. Can we count that? Can we sample that? And we can also phrase it slightly differently, what words are tending to occur in the same contexts, maybe the same sentences, the same documents, the same articles, and so forth. And so um, that's what we mean by co-occurrence. And most of the time when we're dealing with co-occurrence, we're talking about matrices, either really big, sparse matrices or very um, somewhat smaller, denser matrices. And a lot of the times what this all results in is basically comparing vectors, you know, angles between vectors to measure some notion of the relatedness between these terms. 
And so just a real simple kind of visualization, if we think about a word-by-word -word representation where we show uh, some kind of measure between words that are occurring together, uh, we typically end up with like, you know, all the words in our corpus being represented by a row and a column. Most of them don't occur together, and so we get like 95% of the matrix or more is zeros or empties, and so this, this can become rather difficult to deal with. Um, same thing, word by context uh, matrices, kind of a similar issue. We're basically just indicating here which words are occurring in which context, and so we can then see, okay, words that are used in some of the same context probably have something to do with each other. Again, we get very big, sparse kinds of matrices. And so um, there have been various efforts over the years to try and deal with these large and sparse matrices. Okay, um, of course. What is context on the previous slide? Context can be treated, imagine if you like, sentences, or tweets, or paragraphs, or documents, kind of whatever your unit of interest is. So two words that occur in the same Wikipedia article, maybe they have something to do with each other. Or if you're working with tweets, maybe two words that occur in the same tweet. That's, so it's a very general or generic notion of context. Um, and so, um, so the zeros have always been recognized as kind of a difficulty here. They make the matrices rather unwieldy. And if you're having a lot of zeros and you are doing vector operations in one of your values in one of your cells and your vector is zero, it tends to zero out everything. So you end up almost with a kind of a matching, uh, requiring exact matches to, 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 to reach any kind of non-zero uh, scores. And so there have been various kinds of ideas for reducing uh, creating more dense representations. Uh, one that has been around for a while, latent semantic analysis, kind of reducing the dimensionality of these kind of matrices by doing singular value decomposition and effectively kind of compressing the columns in these matrices together so that either similar words or similar contexts come together into a single vector. Um, and uh, more recently, uh, uh, methods like word to vec that we kind of generically called word embedding uh, methods are, are learning, trying to learn vectors uh, by optimizing different sorts of functions that um, where vectors are, vector of a word is more like words that it tends to occur with and less like words that it doesn't occur with. And that, that seems to be one of the things that, that these kind of approaches have added that's a little different is there's a specific notion of representing differences and not just making everything similar. And so perhaps they're able to get a little more um, sharpness in the results. Um, and so when we go through these kinds of operations, and you know the numbers here are not particularly significant, but we end up with a denser matrix that is not a lot of zero values, and a smaller number of dimensions. And so these are a little easier to work with. Um, and so um, when we have these kinds of measures, uh, we're able to measure relatedness between words using these vectors. Uh, and oftentimes we do evaluations comparing these to human judgments, uh, where we do some kind of rank correlation. Um, we're not specifically dealing with senses here at this point. Notice the words that we're talking about, we're kind of actually glomming together different senses, uh, although there are different ways of specifically trying to represent these senses. Um, and so um, results that have been fairly consistent for for a while now, and, and again, some of the methods haven't been around for as long as some of these results have been. But in general, when you compare especially to these human judgments, these, these word embedding methods do, in fact, do quite well. Um, the methods using some of the dictionary content have, have likewise done well. Information content kind of pops up and does pretty well. Um, and that's relative to these human baselines where we're doing rank correlation comparisons. The differences are a little less extreme in task-based evaluations, maybe because uh, you know, human agreement on similarity and relatedness judgments is a little flaky sometimes. So there's some kind of interesting issues there as well. Um, so what do we do? What can we do with this? So we've got a lot of ways to measure similarity and relatedness. So hopefully I convinced you of that by now. What can we possibly do? Well, um, one problem that we have been uh, looking at uh, quite uh, quite, quite relatively recently is just this idea of uh, enhancing ontologies. And there was a sum of task 
2016 that kind of posed the question in a very nice way, where we have a word and definition from Wiktionary, which is updated pretty regularly, that isn't present in WordNet. And that's actually a pretty realistic scenario. WordNet hasn't been updated uh, in quite a number of years now. So it's kind of a real problem. And so WordNet, for example, does not include selfie. Um, and so what, what can we do with WordNet without selfie? Um, well, so ways to think about the problem. Uh, the Wiktionary definition you can see a photographic self-portrait, um, and there are more than 100,000 definitions in WordNet, uh, and what basically we want to find the best, closest location for selfie in WordNet, and either position selfie as a synonym or as a more specific example of something already in WordNet. And so some candidates that I sort of selected here, for example, self-portrait, that is in WordNet, or photo, that's in WordNet. Those are both clearly kind of related. Now, how could we, how could we recognize those kinds of things automatically? Um, well, we tried a couple of different things. Uh, one is just comparing uh, the definitions from Wiktionary with the definitions from WordNet, looking at these kind of simple things like, like overlaps. Um, and here we're kind of relying on some of the structure of definitions where you often have a mention of this most specific, the more specific ancestor as a part of the definition. And so in that Wiktionary definition, you do see the term self-portrait, which is in fact in WordNet. And so if you can recognize that kind of thing, you can probably decide to put selfie as a uh, more specific example of self-portrait, uh, which would probably be the right thing to do. Uh, so we tried, we did that, and we also um, modified our, our kind of gloss vector idea yet again where the words and the definitions were represented by word to vec embeddings. And um, basically we found, got, got um, vectors using this kind of word to vec uh, approach uh, and that we replaced each word in, in our uh, uh, definitions with one of those embeddings and then measured the Wiktionary version of that with all the WordNet versions of that to find the nearest home. Um, this worked a little less well than we had hoped, actually. I think in part maybe because there, we, we just kind of treated all the words in the definitions equally. And there is, in definitions, not just that mention of a parent or a superclass, but also a lot of differentia that makes, uh, that, that defines the distinctions <laughs> of a concept uh, from the other concepts. And so uh, it may have been led astray a little bit by all the differentia, perhaps. Um, and so, um, so that, that's, that's one example of something we've been doing with, uh, with this. Uh, another example is just discovering hypernyms, these is a relations. And there is a sum of all task this year that's just concluding. Uh, task papers are due Monday, so, so that's, that's ongoing. Uh, problem there was pretty straightforward. You get 32 gigabytes of web corpus, uh, produces a chains for a set of words that they give you. Uh, so, for example, they might give you cat, and then using the contents of that 32 gigabytes, you're supposed to come up with a chain, like cat is a feline, is a mammal, is an animal. Um, again, kind of a combination of, of relatively straightforward uh, approach with a, a less a common approach, uh, or it's actually a fairly common approach, but a, a different approach, um, using patterns, uh, just simple patterns, like looking for if in the corpus it says a cat is a feline, let's jump on that and use that. Uh, otherwise, we got into the business of, of uh, looking at word to vec analogies, uh, which are basically uh, A is to B is C is to Y. Uh, figuring out those kind of analogies using very simple vector math. Uh, there's sort of the canonical example of king is to man is queen is to woman. If you uh, subtract the vector of man from king and add the vector of woman to it, you get a vector that is relatively close to the associated vector of queen. And so we tried to do this with other kinds of, uh, of, uh, of, of words. So, so we, we provide exemplars like opera and music. So opera, opera is a kind of music. And, and then ballet is a X and actually comes back with dance, which is kind of nice. Um, pear and fruit, uh, wheat, grain. Works sometimes, other times you just get kind of goofy results. Like Barack Obama is a president. Herman Melville is, according to this, a chief executive. So, uh, there's some there's some noisiness there. Uh, the simple patterns work pretty well when they work. Uh, the word to vec analogies would usually give us an answer, but oftentimes kind of noisy. So really, the question right now is how to maybe come up with better exemplars that are going to give us something a little more reliable in terms of our results here. Um, and so one last uh, what can we do now idea, uh, just. Word sense disambiguation. This is something we've been doing off and on for quite a while now, using these ideas of similarity and relatedness. Uh, that is, we want to assign each word 
the sense, each word in a sentence, assign the sense to it, which is going to make it most related to the senses of all the other words in that sentence. Um, and if we set things up like that, we actually get a, a kind of a trellis-like effect where basically we're looking for the assignment of senses here that is going to maximize the global similarity, if you will, between all of these different senses. The premise there is that in our text, the words we use should to some degree be similar and related to each other. Now this doesn't always hold up, but it, it can be, uh, it is sometimes fairly successful. Um, this gets more complicated if you look at more than pairwise relationships, and so we don't want to don't do that. Um, we've done a lot of this actually using UMLS, uh, which has been kind of interesting, and uh, have actually found some of these information content ideas work better than we expected. Um, also have done some things with WordNet with that. Um, so the future, a few brief words about the future. Uh, I want to build dictionaries. So this, uh, you know, that's, my, that's my feeling about it. I, I really like that as a problem. Uh, what do I mean by building dictionaries? I mean identify word senses, you write definitions for them, you organize them into some kind of hierarchy and also find other relations between them. That's it. How do you break that down into a problem? Uh, well, we start by clustering context. Find a lot of examples of, word, of a particular word in context. Cluster those into senses uh, so that you have some collection of contexts, each of which represents a particular sense. Um, and we can use all these different kinds of representations that we've been talking about as a way to do this with these kind of co-occurrence ideas, uh, kind of pick, pick, pick which makes the most sense. Um, once we have done that, the clusters that we discover are not necessarily going to correspond to our human intuitions about senses. And so we want to generate, I want to generate definitions for those. And so uh, the clusters, again, remember, are made up of these contexts, and so maybe we can leverage those um, leverage that content for the cluster to find something that describes that sense. And so you can think about using, you know, sort of simple association measures to find distinct terms in the clusters. Um, or you can also think about maybe looking for hypernym relationships in those clusters. And then if you find one of those, building off of that a kind of definition that describes both the parent and the differentia based on the content of that cluster or other content that we may leverage uh, off of that. Um, once we have generated a definition, then maybe we can use some of these definition uh, ontology enhancement ideas based on definitions to add to an existing ontology and maybe add those new senses as synonyms or more specific examples of some other relation and so forth. Um, and this is not, I mean, this, this is like a very brief description. It's not as easy as all that. Um, these are some famous uh, lexicographers, uh, uh, Dr. 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 Johnson, uh, George Miller, Dr. Dr. Murray, and Aaron Aaron McKean uh, of WordNick uh, fame, a project I like very much. Um, and so it's not as easy as that, but this is kind of the direction that I'm that I'm thinking of, and uh, I think that's a good place to close. So thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you about all this. So we have some time for questions. So, there's lots of kinds of relatedness and similarities where we all agree that a cat is an animal or is a feline and things like that, but there are other kinds of things where we yeah. don't agree that Barack Obama is a Christian or we don't agree that <laughs> climate change is uh, a environmental <laughs> thing, like yeah. kind of human cause or something like that. Right, so right. Like, or if a burrito is a sandwich. <laughs> Ooh, no. yeah. oh. And so what do we do when so we're building machine learning systems that sort of take advantage of a lot of these sort of semantic systems where we make assumptions that either there's cultural factors that load into these things or that maybe there are things that we can't all agree on but we're still building technologies that are making decisions that, that come out of these kinds of relationships. How do you think about like how we build technologies or right. what, where we draw boundaries for the kinds of... Right, that's, 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 a, that's a great question. I think, it's, I think it's an important question for any of these kinds of methods. I mean, what, what, what happens so often is that we, we get a big chunk of data and we have an algorithm and it starts spitting stuff out and we just kind of accept it as, okay, well, that's what the algorithm says. Um, I think certainly when we're talking about, for example, recognizing senses or building is a hierarchies, that it is possible that we may have multiple of those. And so if you have, for example, the case of you know, Barack Obama is a Christian, Barack Obama is an atheist, Barack Obama is a Muslim, Barack Obama is, is what have you, um, we would recognize all of those. I mean, the, the, we would not simply have one, we would recognize 
all of them, and, and I, I think would then realize that there is I, either we are splitting a distinction that is um, maybe too fine-grained, which isn't the case in this example. It's more so revealing this kind of contradictory information. Um, and so I think we've, we, we'd all, we always want to be careful about just taking one best answer, right? I mean, so we're, and so I think in these cases where there may be uh, contradictory information or different attitudes, we would end up with results that would reflect that, or we'd want to build it with results that reflect that and, being, and be mindful of the potential for some controversy um, in, in certain kinds of things. Um, also being aware, I mean, this, this reminds me of a, another issue that we think about, we, as, and, and I didn't talk about it here, but just, you know, with these word embeddings, um, there are some implicit biases in these word embeddings that are pretty pernicious, uh, having to do with gender roles and, uh, and, 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 and race and other kinds of, of, of important issues where that if you just kind of accept their results right off the bat without sort of looking at them and asking the question, does this reflect the, you know, what, what, what kind of ideas do we have reflected here? Um, you can run into some trouble. So I think, I think building in this kind of um, possibility of contradictory or deliberately false, you know, misleading information getting into our data sets, uh, biased information getting in, and, and then, you know, at least recognizing it and what to do with it is another question. I guess, you know, that's some thoughts, generally. Mm -hmm. i follow up on that a little bit, Ted? Yeah, So, course. Tversky and Kahneman have a really interesting set of experiments where they can drive people's similarity judgments in one way or yeah. another with context. So, is a quarter similar to a pizza, or right. is a quarter similar to a dollar bill? Right. And I can set up context where I can, I can push you, push people generally to make judgments right. that are, you know, very. And that's not about contradictory information. It's not really about right. bias. It's really about uh, some, something, multiple kinds of similarity in our heads. Mm -hmm. And there's an interplay that they suggest, but I don't think it's been followed up very well, about the kind of explanation you build of the judgment you make. Mm -hmm. So I think pizza and quarters are similar because of shape. Right. And I think quarters and dollar bills are similar because of their function. Right. And um, I can. Uh, you started off in the beginning of your talk, I think, a very lovely way of giving us a bunch of explanations about why these mm. two things were similar and why right. they weren't, and made it made us believe you that <laughs> maybe our similarity judgments right. might not have gone there. So, will you talk a little bit about the right. interplay between a, a, a sort of numeric judgment of, of right. you know, how similar mm. something is and the explanation of, of why that judgment might be? Right. Yeah. That's a, that's a that's a, a very interesting and I think kind of important. Uh, aspect to this. And I think it's one of the reasons why, especially with the similarity of kind of this, this painstakingly explained definition of what we mean by similarity relative to kind of is a properties, because there's so many ways that, that we can indeed go off in different directions. Um, I think um, what, what your comment reminded me of is just a lot of work now with these kinds of measures is evaluated relative to human judgments of, you know, you give a human subject 30 or 100 pairs of, of words and basically ask them to send similarity to it. I, I think that's a pretty perilous undertaking uh, where I think it's, it's pretty clear that previous examples can very clearly influence the judgment of the subsequent ones. And so unless you're really careful about how you do that, um, you get some kind of wildly differing results. So I think, I think human, you know, these, these human reference standards, I think, are useful for kind of calibrating and improving these measures, but there's a real limit to them for, for the reason that you're saying. Um, I think certainly um, being able to explain in general, I think, is, is becoming increasingly important for, you know, kind of relative to the first question, um, why would we draw a conclusion that a person is a particular religion, for example? That seems to merit some explanation. Um, cat as a feline is, is perhaps a little less, uh, less controversial in some ways. But again, being able to explain that I think is important. Um, with similarity, I guess with, um, uh, with similarity and explaining similarity, I, I, I think that um, in the case of pizza and quarter sharing the same shape, I, 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 I think that, that would, relative to an ontology of, that organizes the world in terms of shapes, that would, that would seem like a reasonable similarity judgment. I think um, 
There's no Order. such ontology. Pardon me? There is no such ontology. There are a lot of crazy <laughs> ontologies out there, but I've never not, heard of one that organizes the world one, by shapes. Not that one, organizing the world by shapes. Um, well, it's, um, but then I think with, with a quarter is currency, I think that's a more clear kind of traditional is a relationship there. And so I think in terms of, of, of the explanatory part of it, I think kind of relying on those, on the resources that we have to show that, you know, in this case, quarter is, you know, two steps away from currency would give us one piece of information. Um, and then somehow if there is this notion of shape in our resource, that pizza happens to be the same shape as a quarter, we can you know, kind of do that. But um, So I'm not sure I'm, I'm quite addressing the question, but I do agree. I think it's important to be able to explain, uh, because I think we draw more and more judgments from this kind of, of, of uh, information with increasingly complicated methods. Um, and so it's very easy to just kind of black box the whole thing and just sort of push it away and not think about it. So, yeah. uh, one area that you touch on, and I think relates to this, is the, the whole high dimensional vector space that you have with embeddings. Uh -huh. um, and your example is 300, which pops up quite often. Yes. You know, whether it's 30 or 300 or 3,000. Uh, and all I've seen so far is cosine similarity yeah. operations in that vector space. But it seems to me that uh, just comparing uh, two vectors and how uh, much variation there is among the whole right. vector space. In other words, there could be a lot of exploration there. Do you see any work in that area? Or is I think that, I mean, the short answer, short answer is yes. I think. Um, I think you're right about the, the cosine. Uh, it, it, it's kind of, to some extent, I think sometimes some work is, is, is basically motivated to show this is a good measure. And I want to compare relative to previous results that have been done using cosine. And I'm going to do the same thing and, and therefore get my comparable result. But I think if, if we add a criteria of explainability, which I think is a very reasonable thing to do with all of these methods, then I think being able to look at and say, well, these two vectors are close together because these particular dimensions uh, are closer together. Uh, this leads us into the idea of maybe trying to interpret what some of these abstract dimensions might be representing. You can sometimes see, you know, theories that there's a very, this this dimension is representing something about spiritual beliefs, and this represents gender and so forth. I'm not sure how systematic that is, but I think these are extremely interesting and important kinds of things to be thinking about. Let's take one last question from Danielle. Yeah, so um, most of what we've been talking so far is similar in the text space, but I'm curious if you can comment on how some of these methods and approaches might translate to other spaces and thinking like uh, similarity in abstract visual patterns, for example, or abstract imagery. Uh, so Right, yeah, so, so right, and so, so my early, my initial examples were kind of relying on visual similarity, and so I, I actually thought about that, uh, like my undermining my, my case here, should I just start with words and only text, for goodness sake, um, and, and I decided to miss that. Um, and so I think some of the basic principles are, are very much the same, I mean, you know, talking about shared characteristics. Um, and uh, you know, to what degree do two images share certain kinds of characteristics? Uh, can we measure similarity based on that? Uh, this is something that I am largely unfamiliar with. My, the closest I've come to image type data is basically dealing with captions on images or descriptions of images, which, which can be very useful. And again, we do some of the same kinds of things. You know, this, you know, this is a picture of a cute little kitten meowing in a field and then comparing that to other pictures with uh, with, with text-based descriptions on it. And so, uh, at least from my side, I, I, you know, I, I guess I'm so oriented towards text that I'm often looking for those kinds of captions. But I think, obviously, um, the notion of similarity uh, in relatedness extends far beyond uh, just text, and, and there should be some common ground there. And I think it's, it's, I like similarity and relatedness just in general. I like to think about it. I like to think about it with images. I like to think about it with ideas and everything else. And so, um, uh, you know, I, I think thinking about it in terms of images or chemical compounds or whatever, I think is, is, is likewise a very fascinating kind of possibility. Great. We've run out of time, but thanks. <laughs>
Okay. Oh, that was a very good one.